There was once a time when local communities largely fed themselves. Farms and communities were connected by the food that was grown and sold locally on land that was locally owned and cared for, oftentimes by multiple generations of families. But with the invention of refrigerated railway cars in the late 1800s, produce and other perishables could be shipped across the country. And as preservation methods, transportation, and engineering technology advanced, so too did the boundaries of our food systems, eventually allowing for the global trading of commodities, and hence the global food system was born. But as you'll hear many times throughout this series, the general consensus is that what we need now is to return to our dependence on local and regional food systems because of how vulnerable the global food system is to disruptions and how damaging it is to our ecosystems. And to avoid confusion, it's important to note that local food systems are contained within regional food systems. And usually there's no clear demarcation of local systems by things like town or county lines. But only that, according to the USDA, local foods are marketed through direct sales to consumers through avenues like CSAs, farmers markets, grocery stores, restaurants, schools, and other outlets and mainly benefit the local economy where you live. Production involves all the activities and resources needed to grow food for human consumption. For production to be efficient, responsible, and viable, we must ensure that people have equal access to the land needed to grow food, or the animals that will become food, and that the land is being cared for or treated in ways that promote good soil health and stewardship for sustainability. Homestead Farms. James Masco, they call me Kink. I was raised on a dairy farm, and so, I mean, this farming's been in my background all my life. Being around animals, raising animals, um, has been in my background since I've been five years old, actually. I started out with, with horses. My husband and I, you know, started our, our, our farming business as, as kind of a hobby to provide, you know, for ourselves, homesteading type thing. When we first started, it was small. We only had 53 acres. Now we've grown. I mean, we had a handful of cattle. Now we've got over 100. We had one tractor and one piece of machinery of each, you know, a mower, a baler, a rake. And now we have uh, five, six tractors and newfangled machinery and it's been fun the whole time and it's still fun. We primarily raise grass finished Angus beef and pasture raised pigs. We're a true farm to table uh, business. We raise all of our animals here on the farm. They're born here on the farm. Um, we also do uh, vegetables as well um, for mainly our own use but we will take uh, extra uh, overflow produce to the farmer's markets to sell. The Masco Homestead is one of over 6,000 small farms in western New York. And with meat as their main commodity, they're also a part of the largest segment of agriculture in the U.S. But despite producing a product in such high demand, the Mascos, and quite frankly many small family farms just like theirs, aren't exactly laughing all the way to the bank. Globalization, which is the term used to describe the increasing connectedness and interdependence of world cultures and economies, has basically forced the price of commodities and inputs to unsustainable levels for small farmers. It has gotten harder over the years. I mean, we're making less than we were like 10, 15 years ago for the same amount of work and, and effort, you know, because all the inputs are costing more, labor's costing more, and 
it's harder to do it, you know. We were established in 1984. Um, we actually started out as a, we thought we would be more of a nursery business, like um, instead of growing fruits and vegetables, but our first crops ended up being um, strawberries to try to get some seed money so we could get the rest going. And we found that when we grew the strawberry fields and some of the first crops that we grew that the marketing was pretty easy down here because people were looking for it. I'm Adam Abers, I'm their son. I help out on the farm. I, I do a lot of the field work with my dad and whatever else needs done on the farm, just different things. So over my house, I have poultry, chickens and, and ducks and stuff like that. So, and I, I actually like growing out different fruit and nut trees. So I, I don't know, I, I still like it. When we started, I was probably more enthusiastic about it, but uh, made a lot more mistakes and learned as we went along. And uh, <clears throat> I, I do love the process of farming. It just seems like it's kind of like overwhelming right now at this point in my life. There's policies I'd like to see cha you know, changed. I'd like to see it like so, just like, you know, we don't, we don't raise dairy, but it would be nice to see like especially in New York State, be able to have like retail outlets like this, be able to carry raw milk and things like that where it's restricted and different states have different rules. I just think for small farms, it would be nice to have the, the restrictions off of that. Small farms in Western New York make up a vital part of our local economy and are a part of the type of regional food system that many people ended up having to turn to during the height of the pandemic. And while there are indeed many strengths in our region's food system, there are also many ongoing issues that preceded COVID-19. It's been on a tightrope for a very long time. It's, um, it's never been sustainable and it's only gotten farther away from sustainability. And what happens is if there's one disruption in the supply chain, people go hungry. We need to go back to the small farms and back to one farm feeding 20 or 30 families. Um, so I run the farm store, um, and then I'm also in charge of vegetable production, and we're starting some berries and things like that. When I was a child, it was very, uh, it was an agrarian society, so there were many small farms, and they were diverse farms. So things are so specialized now that typically there's one major crop that carries the income stream for a farmer. The biggest challenge that we have in our food system is that it's very brittle. Yeah, it's easily broken. And last year during COVID, the shelves were empty of meat. The farmers were producing the meat, but the supply chain was too long. So we need to get local food back available to the, to the public. You know, it's amazing the, the pressures a global food system puts on small family farms. But I believe that the only a uh, sustainable way is going to be local food and small family farms are going to connect with the consumers and we're already seeing a turnaround in that realm. While right to farm laws and the National Farm Bill have sought to help farmers continue to produce and shore up regional food systems, the reality is that small farms have oftentimes been treated as dispensable. And as such, they've had to bear the burden of many crippling disadvantages, both natural and manufactured. Approximately 20% of New York's land area, or nearly 7 million acres, is farmland. And with over 33,000 family farms helping to drive the economy, New York is a major agricultural state ranking in the top 10 in production of over 30 commodities, with dairy being the largest segment of the state's agricultural sector. But New York State has lost over half a million acres of farmland since the 1980s, and over the past 20 years, more than 11 million acres have been lost in the United States. Western New York offers prime land and resources for food production, which is seen in the diversity of food produced from this region. But like many rural areas, farmland is under threat from residential or commercial development. 
The loss of land for agriculture means the loss of local food production and ultimately the loss of money made and recirculated in the area. The loss of farmland is a consequence of difficulties ranging from the uncontrollable, like climate change, to discriminatory lending policies that have been affecting minority farmers for decades. We came in 1969, June 11, and we, there were 13 of us on the family, so we all went to pick strawberry for Ross and Joey. And when we all worked together, my father was bringing home $1,000 a week versus $27 that we used to make him for Rico. You know, it intrigued me to want to become a farmer because that was money. So in 1990, Ross and Joey, he sold me one farm and a handshake, uh, 47 acres, and that was the beginning of me wanting to become a farmer. We used to, we used to deal with Clifter, and um, now become Refresco, that's my hat. We used to take on 3,500 tons a year, and one year they just came down and told me they only wanted 800 tons. The, the reason was, they were buying grain from California, and they were mixing it with ours. They call it the 4951. 49% of their, 51% of ours. That, that was that was a lie. They were just buying the grain so cheap over there, already already uh, pressed into juice. So we 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 were going on there. We had about 600 acres, and I had to. Uh, keep downsizing, and uh, I went down to 300 acres, that's where we are right now. Every year, the price of the grain going down to the bottom. Take $1,500 an acre to run an acre of grape. They're paying all 750 So we just keep borrowing money and borrowing money and use all the collateral that we had. Now we just flat down to the limit. Every obstacle comes along with me not having a loan with FSA. So every time we apply, we, we get denied because it's just uh, the way of the law, I guess. And thinking of trying to sell some farm just to pay up the debt and keep going. You gotta do what you can to stay in business. The obstacles encountered by small farmers like Roberto Fred are validated by the findings of the Food Future Western New York Initiative, which states that small farms are struggling with long-term disinvestment and a wavering public commitment to address racial justice. And these findings are further upheld by research from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, which reveals 50 years of predatory and discriminatory policies and practices by the USDA. I think I have to take you back uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, when we know for a fact uh, that socially disadvantaged producers were discriminated against by the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, we, we know this. Uh, when you look at the COVID relief packages that had been passed and distributed by USDA prior to the American Rescue Plan, and you take a look at who disproportionately received the benefits of those COVID payments, it's pretty clear that white farmers did pretty well under that program because of the way it was structured. It's structured on size and structured on production. Dave Zittle from Amos Zittle and Sons, a fourth generation farmer. Um, our farm started back in the 1800s. We run about 350 acres of vegetables, about three acres of greenhouses, and we used to, as of a year ago, owned a retail market for 30 plus years. So we're in production um, right from start to finish. It used to be much more mom and pop. Uh, we grew things like radishes and parsley and peas. We now grow less crops, but more acres of those crops. We used to think that a three truck load day down to the Clinton Valley market was big and that would be 600 containers. Um, now, if we're not doing three to 5,000 containers a day, um, we're not having a good day. 
Yes, there has been climate change. No, I don't know the answer of why and how and um, all the environmental uh, portions of it, but I think that overall it's actually benefited us. We have a very short growing season here. I think most people would say that we're trending warmer, not colder. So with that being said, our springs are a little earlier, our falls are a little later. So that extension of season has actually helped us more than hurt us. There is truth to the fact that warming temperatures can benefit some of the more drought tolerant crops in certain regions and extend growing seasons in colder climates. And crops like rice and wheat can thrive from higher carbon dioxide concentrations. But generally speaking, climate change is not only a major driver of land loss, but according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the increase in natural disasters like droughts, floods, storms, and wildfires due to climate change are causing billions in crop and livestock losses every year. Workforce issues can severely hamper the production potential of small farms. And while COVID-19 does factor into some of the current workforce issues, there are more complicated reasons for the steady decline. For example, with so many initiatives geared at making higher learning more accessible, the result is an expansion of job opportunities in many other fields, making it very rare for younger people to choose farming over more enticing alternatives. The fact is that without something like the H-2A program, which allows for farmers to hire foreign laborers on a temporary basis, the workforce issue would be much worse. As it stands, H-2A workers make up an estimated 10% of the U.S. crop farm workforce. Of course, for farmers who can't find locals to employ, some of the requirements for them to use the H-2A visa program are very complex and can be prohibitive. Another emerging threat that gives rise to the disappearance of small farms and impacting production is the aging out of farmers who don't have a succession plan for keeping their farms going. We, we have, um, you know, two children, but they cannot work the farm. So like, you know, if we both died, you know, something would have to be done. And we, we don't have plans like that, unfortunately, figured out. I got five kids. Two boys and three girls, and there's nobody with the love or the ambition of being a farmer. Farming is a challenge. It's a, you depend on the Lord to make it or break it. We're, we're kind of getting to that stage in our life where we need to figure out a succession plan, but it's hard to find somebody, like my son doesn't exactly want to take the whole reins of it, but I don't know if some kind of an employee-owned co-op or something like that would work. It's, it, those are hard questions, and it's something we are in the process of trying to start to navigate now, but we don't know the answer. We'll probably need help when we <laughs> get more serious about that, so. The average age of farmers in the U.S. is around 57 years. But according to the USDA in a 2021 editorial, 26% of beginning farmers are under the age of 35, and beginning farmers account for 29% of U.S. farms. So to offset the decline in family farms due to aging farmers, more beginning farmers need to take up the reins. But there are obstacles that are getting in the way of that, and one of them is access. Many young farmers can't access the capital needed to purchase land and farms, so they enter into leasing agreements that don't always guarantee long-term options or even a pathway to ownership. The lack of security is a very distracting burden and most certainly a deterrent to young farmers going into farming as a career. Creating pathways for young or emerging farmers to land and infrastructure that's available and affordable is probably the best strategy on which to build all the other efforts to strengthen our region's food system. Natural soil erosion from wind and water is exacerbated by poor agricultural practices like deforestation, monocropping, and tilling. These methods deprive the soil of nutrients and can result in higher rates of runoff, causing the soil to deteriorate to the point where the land can no longer be cultivated. 
It's unfortunate that poor agricultural practices and deficient policies meant to boost production actually contribute to the land loss, climate change, and aging farming population that in turn have a dire effect on production. Later on, we'll explore possible solutions for alleviating some of these concerns. But until then, please join us in our next episode as we examine the processing component of the food system.